see your rocks. I don't see your rocks. Oh, okay. Bricks. Well, there you go. <laughs> Sounds like I'm on. All right. Uh, I need a bigger desk. Uh, don't move. Uh, that's not going to work. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> everybody doing okay today? <sighs> On this fine summer morning. Not so hot today, though. It feels good. Yesterday was nice, too. It's like, you know, you don't realize that 89 or 90 feels great. <laughs> We pray about yeah absolutely absolutely and what else okay absolutely God's got that yeah what else y'all want to pray for world peace mama okay okay Anybody else? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. We're okay. Excellent. Thank you, Solomon. <laughs> From the rising to the setting. Hmm. Okay, what else? Uh, you said Miss Judy, right? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Yep. Amen. People to be saved. That's right. Yes, ma'am. Amen. Well, I can speak for our school. We go, uh, some of us fanatical people, and we take oil and put it on the top of all the doors <laughs> and uh, pray for protection and, and all of that. So uh, that'll happen our first week while we're back, which is coming up soon. So, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the kids start August 7th. Yes, sir. August 7th, in two weeks. Yeah, it's a modified schedule. It's a modified schedule. Mm -hmm. I agree, but, you know, it's time. <laughs> yeah, I've already been in my classroom. Yay, I'm excited. Once I get in there and start putting stuff on the walls, it's like, yeah. 
<laughs> After Labor Day, yeah, because the, the schedule was based on field work, yes, sir. Forever. The uh, high school. 9 through 12. No, it's all good. It's all good. I'll have Shirley's uh, granddaughter. Yeah. What else can we pray for? There you go. There you go. Oh yeah. I think we all we all like that. Yes. <laughs> right. Right. Amen. That would be called selflessness. Mm-hmm. Selflessness. Yes, sir. But you can add her again. Amen. <laughs> ah, there you go. Amen. She takes good care of you. You're supposed to say amen there. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Okay. Amen. Have, I, have our, our sweet peas moved yet? Okay. We're still praying for them. Well, they ought to be coming while they're <laughs> in the process. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I don't know. Yeah, okay. Ooh. All right, guys. It's a wonderful day uh, in the Lord's house, and we have the, the freedom and the capacity to come in here and the good health to come in here and to sit in air conditioning and a nice seat and just... Uh, Worship the Lord. Things could be a whole lot worse. Amen. So glad to be here. Amen. Glad to see all of y'all here as you come and seek uh, the Word, which is what we'll be talking about today. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for today and thank you so much for you and who you, your sovereignty, your all present, your all power. You're all of every attribute that you have. We just worship you. And we come seeking you today and want to be in your presence and just soak you in for all of the things that are within our hearts and all the uh, issues and uh, difficulties and all of our trials and all of the things that we face, all of our joys, all of our... Um, desires, all of our emotions, oh God, we just lift them up to you and ask you to be Lord over that. We pray, Father, that you would help us as we know we're in our flesh and we do things and say things. We thank you, Father, that you know that we're dust and that we're frail and uh, you promise not to topple over a, a, a bruised reed. You won't break and we thank you for that, Lord, for understanding us and coming to the earth and becoming one of us so that you could understand. And I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you for your um, presence here. I thank you for Holy Spirit that you've given as a gift, as um, a, a deposit, Lord, an inheritance. And I thank you for him. I thank you for how he leads us and guides and convicts and speaks truth. I, 
We just praise you for who you are, Lord. There's lots of uh, requests that have come before you, and we humbly come to your throne of grace and mercy. And we bow down and put these petitions at your feet for those that are sick, for those that are struggling, uh, for those in our church body that are needing a touch from you, Lord. Bless Miss Judy and Elena and uh, Robin, Lord, Billy. We just lift up those that are um, needing uh, something that, that only you can do, Lord. And we thank you for that. We thank you for our, uh, what you're going to do for our lost family members, Lord. Those that uh, are heavy on our hearts, that you would save them before it's everlasting too late. We ask you to hear our cry in that, Lord. We pray for those that are struggling with cancers and other things. We thank you, Lord, for those that have come through surgeries and that they've become miracles. And we thank you for that, Lord. We pray for our country that your presence and your power would lead in God, our administration and our Congress, our Supreme Court. And we ask you, Father, to forever uh, bless us as we continue to be friends with Israel, Lord. I pray for that. We pray, Lord, for the missionaries and the believers all over the world that are underground, that are worshiping within this Lord's Day. And we pray you'd be with them, Lord, those that are... Uh, persecuted and in prison as especially, Father, for their faith. Because we thank you that we can sit here and openly worship you, Father. We ask you to be with the lesson and the upcoming message, the songs uh, the uh, within the sound booth and all that goes on there, Lord. I pray for a blessing and I ask you to be with us in a special way. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, um, last week, we were looking at the parable, and we're in uh, Matthew 13. So we're looking at the parables of the kingdom. These are kingdom parables, and he's explaining. Jesus is prophesying of things to come. He's warning the disciples and us in the church age of all the things that are going to take place. The Old Testament prophets talked and talked about the millennial kingdom and understood in their prophecies of that thousand year reign. They did not understand the mystery of the gospel age, the mystery of the church age. That was something that uh, they could not grasp. And talk, Paul talks about this in Romans uh, 14 and the mystery of the kingdom of, of God here on earth. And it was the plan that uh, Jesus would die for the Jews and what they didn't get and the Gentiles, which is us. <laughs> and if you're thankful, say amen. <laughs> I'm so thankful that it was to include all. And these parables, Jesus is trying to teach the disciples and the people of that day, as well as the Pharisees, that... Uh, group that was persecuting him. He was, as we talked about last week, showing mercy to the unbelievers. So when they were uh, finally before the Bema seat, the judgment seat, that they wouldn't be judged so harshly because we're judged based on the word that we receive and our response to it, right? That ought to scare you a little bit on your response to the word, our obedience. And uh, so last week we were talking about the parable of the sower, and uh, he was talking about the purpose of that, and he explained it. But then um, we, of course, had to stop, and then we want to begin right here with the parable of the wheat and the tares. Now, these parables that we're going to look at, the parable of the wheat and the tares, uh, the mustard seed and the leaven, um, he doesn't necessarily explain uh, all of these like he did with the uh, four soils, um, the hearts of men. Um, but he's going to explain one of them really, really well. We want to look at that. <clears throat> so um, let's go ahead and dive in here. They all speak about the corruption that's to come. What he, when he looked down the uh, annals of time and could see, of course, because he's God, what's going to happen to the church? What's going to happen to the body of Christ down through the ages? And these are some of the warnings of corruption that's going to happen. And these are always fun to study and fun to, uh, to read. 
So we want to look at um, the first part here. Let's start with uh, chapter 13, verse 24, the parable of the wheat and the tares. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven, so here's the mystery, is like a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while men slept, his enemy came, (laughs) his enemy came, and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, now we understand the owner is who? Who's the owner? Who's sowing this seed? Jesus. His servants came to him and said, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? What's the field? It's the world. It's the world. Uh, the word there is cosmos. So that means the world. So uh, you got some... Um, Sir, did you not sow good feed in your field? How, how then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. So right away we know, of course, that it's the evil Satan, the corruption of the world, and the things of the world, the secularism, uh, the viewpoints of the world, the, anything that's going to pull you away from the Word of God, the opinions of, of mankind. And um, there's lots of them out there, aren't there? <laughs> Sir, so uh, when he answered, an enemy has done this, the servant said to him, do you want us then to go and gather them up? And that's a viable question. Do you just want us to go and, and pull this up and, and take care of this mess? But he said, no, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, and he's going to tell us that's going to be his angels, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles. That's already happening. Tares are already bundling up. Just think about that for a minute. To burn them. That's everlasting hell. But gather the wheat into my barn. Ah, the wheat into my barn. Into heaven. That's where we want to go, right? We want to be wheat. As you're born again, you you become a child of God through the salvation and your belief of the death and burial and resurrection and soon coming of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. Even a child can understand that, right? Because children, you know, four and five years old, give their little hearts to Jesus all the time. So uh, when he starts talking about all of this and, and this is all happening, you can see clearly that there's corruption. What's the corruption? The tares, right? And those tares are actually fake wheat called a darnel, D A R N E L. I wanted to, when I was studying that, I was going to make sure I classified that. And it's a fake wheat and you can tell them because whenever you know the wheat starts turning that golden brown and then that brown color darnell turns uh black and within its seeds it has poisonous fruit it's poisonous wheat and uh people back in the day used to use it uh to put into their breads this is weird and their beer that it would make them more dizzy and more high yeah, there you go. So that would be the, it's poisonous. If, if you ate it, it would kill you. And so um, the Lord, isn't that amazing though? When you think about it, the Lord said, don't go uproot all of it because when it's first planted and first coming up, it's all nice and green and pretty and looks like wheat. But when it's time for the harvest and it's time to go get it, then you can tell the difference. Malachi tells us specifically that you will be able to distinguish between the righteous and the wicked. That's in Malachi 3. I go to that one often whenever I'm being attacked and I'm unsure, you know, and I don't want to... Because you want, you want to be careful about who you call righteous and who you call wicked. And, and the Bible says you'll be able to tell them by their fruit. But I like to go back to that Malachi 3 because it's very specific on being able to discern. So I always appreciate that scripture. Go ahead. The fruit. Mm, mm. And then sometimes you can't. Sometimes they're a tear and they look just like the wheat. 
because they're really good at deception. Y'all feeling me? So, uh, <laughs> right on time lesson. And uh, so the, the enemy's purpose in doing this is to destroy the wheat. But a wise farmer knows to wait on this and knows that, that Darnell won't succeed because its, event, its true color, when it's ready, will eventually show what it is. So you, you know, a lot of times you've got to wait on God and, and, and just wait. And, and true colors will eventually rise to the top. We'll talk about that when we get to the leaven and, and uh, of course, the, the mustard tree is a whole little different story, which is kind of cool. So uh, you don't want to uproot the wheat, and you want to make sure that uh, you wait until the harvest time. <clears throat> now this one, in this particular tear and wheat parable, there's the idea of confrontation to where you see that there is evilness and you confront it as evilness. Not that you have to go after you know, that person or whatever that... Uh, but there is evil doctrines that you have to confront, that you have to protect your little ones from so that they'll understand, you know, what the truth is. Because y'all, out on, um, uh, I, with, the, with the boys, I watch these YouTube shorts. You know, y'all watch, you know, the YouTube things. And you got to be careful of the things that are being taught uh, to the young ones and even to the old ones who don't know truth. So uh, it's especially important that we do that. Now, the parable, does anybody want to say anything about tears? Yes, ma'am. And praying for your mama. Amen. Absolutely. <laughs> the Lord hears that cry. Woo! So um, anything about the tears that, or the wheat that you'd like to... All right, so let's move on to the mustard seed. Now, this is the second part of these three corruption, to beware of corruption that's coming in our lives, and, and, and for Jesus, of course, this was in the future, uh, about the church. And uh, this one, he did not necessarily interpret, so we'll take what we've got and, um, you know, see what we can come up with. The, the, um, let me read this to you. Another parable, I'm in 31 through 32. Another parable that he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took, and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds. And y'all know a mustard seed. I mean, it's teeny tiny. When it's grown, it's greater than the herbs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. <clears throat> so we know that that teeny tiny little seed can grow into this huge tree-like shrub. I mean, it can get 15, 20 feet tall. And uh, it was tall enough, Jesus said, so that the birds could come and uh, light in its branches. But this is actually what Jesus is trying to warn the people of is the future dominance of the church that he did not desire at all. A powerful church. A political church that was intertwined with the countries, with the kingdoms the political kingdoms that was intertwined with making treaties that became very wealthy and very rich. And as I say that, you might be thinking, ah, the Roman Catholic Church. And you're right, but don't let that one go. What about the Protestant churches that were pl planted through the Reformation, but that some of the Protestant churches have become large, involved in politics, involved in um, uh, wealth, churches all over, very wealthy. There can be corruption in the Roman Catholic. There can be corruption in the Protestant. Take, for example, example the Anglican church that's in England. And for our version, these are Episcopal churches and different things that are in our region. Uh, then you've got other, you know, Protestant churches that have large conventions. Even uh, the community churches like Open Door, the evangelical community churches, there's a large organization of different churches that are members. So this was a warning of the large churches to come 
and to beware of the corruption that can come out of these large organizations, right? Because you put man in charge of stuff and you put a couple of people at the top like a, a little triumvirate, a little oligarchy, and they can be quite powerful and rule over, and they can be quite wealthy <laughs> and rule over these different things. So um, this example and understanding, because um, once again it says, when it's grown, it is greater than the herb. Now a herb, have y'all seen like um, um, rosemary becomes a nice bushy, I have a rosemary bush in my yard, and you got to cut that thing back because it really grows. Um, and then other, uh, like if you guys have an herb garden for people that like to do that, you know, they get bushy and they produce, but this particular tree he was talking about is going to get so big that birds are going to come and nest in its branches. And so as beautiful as this picture is, of this being such a cool, you know, uh, tree and birds being able to come and nest in its branches, uh, we can also know that these birds, if you'll go back to Matthew 13, 4, that bird is referring to Satan. 13, 4. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. And then um, verse 19, of course, um, was, uh, let's see, let me find 19. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one come, comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. So this is referring, uh, the birds actually refer to the demonic powers, demonic spirits, that even though the church is based on the gospel, regardless of whether it's Catholic, Protestant, what, um, um, Catholic church divided into... Uh, Orthodox, the Orthodox Church, which you see in a lot of our uh, Russia and uh, those particular uh, countries that end in Stan, uh, Tajikistan, uh, and all of the, the, I call them the Stan countries. You have a lot of the uh, Orthodox churches that were a um, creation of when the Roman Catholic Church ultimately divided between Europe and uh, Eastern Europe and Western Europe, basically. And so what he was talking about is um, the corruption that can arise when you've got people in power, right? Come on, you've seen it in, in, in regular, smaller, you know, on a smaller scale church, just a regular church. You see these power struggles and these, and, and, what, and it, it just, it blows up and there's, there's corruption. People get mad, the church splits, and it's a mess. It's an absolute mess. <laughs> so, that's what Jesus is warning them of. Watch, Watch out for, for the, the corruption, corruption of and the birds coming and nesting in the branches. Go ahead. It's exactly what happens. I'm going to get some water while you say it. Right. That's right. Mm hmm. It does with that mustard seed. I love that he. Uh, you, you think about it when you read that, and uh, the 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 bush grows and the trees come. You know, it just like looks like a beautiful picture. Don't you want the church to grow? Yes. Above all, you want the, the, the numbers of saved people, people seeking after Jesus, you want that to grow, you want that to prosper. But you've got to remember too, in Matthew, he also tells us something about quantities. He says the, the road is, is narrow. The pathway that's wide, many enter in. But the pathways that, that's narrow, what's the math there? What does it say? Few enter in. Few enter in. So when you think about the, you know, that type of, of, of thought, you want the church to grow, 
But then when you get within the church, there's wheat and tares. Billy Graham used to say that uh, the church is the best har- <laughs> mission field ever. And we want people to come in. I'm so thankful for the, the fellow that got saved last week. And you want people to come and, and, and you know, get in and start serving him and doing the things of the Lord. But he warned us right here to beware of corruption because it is headed our way. And I have to watch out for corruption in my own heart. Anybody? I have to watch out for uh, who I might think is a wheat and a tear. Anybody? i got to be careful of so many different things in my own <laughs> life that I'm trying to keep, you know, front porch swept off here. But uh, Jesus warned us about that with this mustard seed parable. And the... Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm going to keep that narrow path. Right. With slipping off the path or trying to maneuver the, you know, side of the mountain. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. To guide us. Absolutely. So there's, uh, you know, you think about the, the what he was trying to tell us and um, how it so... And I want to say it's so relevant to today, but it was relevant for every generation. It's been relevant as the apostasy is growing and man is waxing hard and he's falling away, right? So it's so relevant for everything that we are right now. Um, anybody have anything to say about the mustard seed? Wheat and tares. All right, let's go ahead and tackle uh, the leaven and talk about that. <clears throat> And another parable he spoke to them, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leavened. And again, corruption of you know, leaven in the meal and corruption in the community of, um, of what uh, God is doing at this point in time. So um, the, the three measures of, of meal reminds us that when Abraham had uh, some heavenly visitors before the Sodom and Gomorrah thing. And he told Sarah, he, you know, he told her to go and take three measures of meal and prepare cakes for your guests in Genesis 18.6. Um, that kind of you know, flows back to, I think, about that. And uh, this meal, uh, of course, is also representative of a meal offering that uh, you know, whenever you sacrifice, when they would give their sacrifices, there would be a meal offering. And uh, the priest would do that. And the usual amount was three measures. And uh, it tells us that in, in numbers. So um, whenever um, the meal offering is made, it's going to symbolize, of course, Christ in his purity. And um, the uh, amount, the, the time that he was here on the earth. And then there's also parts where they would um, pour oil on it without measure on that bread. Now what did the oil represent? Holy Spirit, right? Without measure. Jesus was full of Holy Spirit beyond measure, right? So such a beautiful picture of what Jesus, and he's just telling, I get cold chills, he's telling about himself here to beware of the leaven, of course, of the Pharisees. Go ahead. Yeah. Right. Protection. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. Now a woman took it and hid three measures of meal till it was all leaven. And this is a, a large amount of leaven. And uh, you notice that it says uh, the... It was, she, she hid in it this, uh, this leaven. And uh, this, of course, would offend a Jew because they would take partake of unleavened bread uh, at their ceremonies, the Passover and different things like that because leaven, of course, represents sin. And so whenever um, we start thinking about that, 
there's no leaven put in the, the meal offering uh, whenever that was made uh, to, to offer to the Lord. And we know that uh, Satan tried to corrupt Jesus at the temptations, and he fell there because there's nothing uh, in Jesus' nature that would respond to the temptations. There was no leaven anywhere in Jesus' life, which is why they would have unleavened bread. But here, Jesus is saying that a woman took this and put this in here. Um, the two lo- they would always make two loaves of bread out of this. And um, the commentator that uh, I've been reading, uh, John Phillips, says the two loaves, one represents the Jews and one represents the Gentiles. I think that's a beautiful picture because that shows um, of, of how, uh, who Jesus came to die for. And so as the woman is mixing this leaven in, that uh, this is symbolizing unbelief. So to look out, he was warning to look out for future in the church unbelief. Now isn't that just perfect? I mean, think about it. Unbelief. Unbelief causes us to fall away. Right? Unbelief, doubt, will cause people to question and, and be uncertain. So he was warning that uh, this is um, equal to the evil that uh, was being spread. And he was warning about wrong teachings here. Now, from the time that uh, the, the Old Testament was written, the Jewish people wrote something called the Talmud. Good morning, y'all. The Talmud. And the Talmud was full of rabbinical teachings based off of the Old Testament teachings, all the do's and don'ts. Over 600 and some rules of do's and don'ts. And guess what those were? They were man-made. Well, within the church, as the church grew and grew and grew, have there been man-made leaven coming into the church of the do's and the don'ts? Yeah. (laughs) So in this one, this is what Jesus was warning about is uh, the, the, the future, you know, teachings of the do's and the don'ts. And all the things, I mean, think about whenever uh, the disciples were accused of breaking off some wheat, that they were working, and um, your disciples don't wash their hands before they eat. You yourself don't wash, you know, your hands. Um, You're casting out demons. We just had this lesson by the the power of Satan himself. (laughs) I mean, all these different rules that um, were going on. Paul even dealt with this uh, leaven at the church of Corinth. And he wrote the letters to the church at Corinth about, remember the guy that was, you know, having troubles and was in adultery and, and all this stuff was going on at the church of Corinth? So even Paul was warning um, about that and, and we can see how Jesus had the um, future there. Last thing I want to say about the unleavened bread, who put the leaven in? What person was it? The woman. Good. So the woman was putting the the, the leaven in. Now, he's not necessarily speaking of a literal woman, but it represents a system. And what what system does Revelation teach about? The what? Yeah. And what did she represent? Keep thinking. It's going to come to you. Mm. Babylon. Babylon, yeah. So he was teaching of that future world system that's going, to put, uh, that's going to put leaven into the bread that's going to be a corrupt system. Good morning, come on in. It was a corrupt system and that was unbelief. Now think about the Babylonian system, this worldwide economic system that's going to be set up by the, the, uh, the false prophet and all the different things that will be going on, and this is what he's referring to in his prophecies about the future. So um, this is, uh, he said, it's likened to leaven, which, is a woman took, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal. So... Um, when it's, uh, you read about a woman acting in a religious way, and this is nothing against women, because you know Jesus loved women. So girls, we're not taking that, you know, that's not a wrong thing. He's referring to it being done in an evil manner, 
so that unbelief, false teachings could be spread in the church. So um, as we finish this up, does anybody have anything to say about the leaven? He said that uh, all these things in verse 34, Jesus spoke to the multitude in parables, and without a parable he did not speak to them. Again, mercy and grace. For the ears that could hear, for the eyes that could see, but for those that could not, the truth was hidden from them, and that's His mercy and grace. Uh, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter things kept secret, secret from the foundation of the earth. And uh, we talked about that last week. So again, you can see that um, the, some of the people who were listening to this uh, had to be completely mystified <laughs> and, uh, and not understanding um, in, in all of that. Now, he explains the parable of the tares, and uh, we'll stop right there, because he doesn't explain the mustard or the leaven. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went to the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. And he answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. That's me. That's what Jesus was saying. That's me. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. Is that you? Look, look around and say, I'm wheat. <laughs> You're wheat. You make bread. You, y'all, what do you love to have whenever you have a Sunday dinner? Margie's got to make three pans of them. Biscuits. Right? You love to have a biscuit with that Sunday dinner. <laughs> so we're wheat. It nourishes. We are meant to nourish other people. We are meant to... Go ahead and preach, sister. We are meant to, you know, be giving out and just and, and, and overflowing and trying to, you know, uh, that, that righteousness. Let it overflow. Let it just flow out. Um, so that's the, you are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. Say, I am not a tear. <laughs> I don't want to be a tear. They are obnoxious and they are poisonous. Okay? The enemy who sowed them is the devil. <laughs> you got me? The devil. The harvest is the end of the age. We're not there yet. We are not there yet. He said, let those wheat and tear grow together. Go ahead. Wheat with feet. <laughs> Only Larry would come up with that, Tammy. There you go. Wheat with feet. <laughs> That's funny. Therefore, oh, excuse me, and the reapers are the angels. His angels are reapers. Isn't that amazing? that that's one of the many roles that angels are messengers, they guard us, they're caretakers. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, things that offend, and those that practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. Now, do you want to be the, the person that practices lawlessness? Do you want to be the person that offends? No. Now, through the righteousness of Christ, if we get that way, His Holy Spirit will convict, won't He? Well, He's he all over you, right? And will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Now, is that going to be fun? Does anybody want to wail and gnash teeth? Not me. In a furnace of fire. Then, I love this, because uh, the, the verse that God gave us when Solomon got his uh, new liver was that he would shine, that God will shine forth. And he did. He has shown forth in that kid. You can't stop him. Amen. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. The righteous will shine forth. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. 
He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Because some people don't have ears to hear. Go ahead and say amen. Amen. Mm -mm. Some people don't have ears to hear. But that's not on me. That's on God. And I'm going to let God deal with tears. And I'm going to make sure I'm weak. Right? With feet. With, feet, with feet to carry the gospel. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, we love you and thank you for your parables and your goodness to, to give these stories that teach us so much about where we are in our world right now. And Lord, help us to those you've given much, much is required. And the light that you give us that we spread that light. We're not spreading darkness. We're spreading light. And so help us, oh God, to trust you with tares, to trust you with mustard seed bushes and powerful organizations. And help us to keep our eyes on you. And what, Lord, as, as I serve you, as we serve you, that we do everything as unto you. For your glory, O oh God, and not our own. Get rid of us, O oh God, selflessness, and help us to be like you so that it overflows. Lord, in the school year with kids and everything, Lord, let righteousness. And in our work, in whatever you've called us to do, let it spill over, Lord. Not, we do not want to be of the darkness, Lord. We do not want to be of the offending, Lord. We want to love you and worship you and show your light, Lord. In Jesus' name, help us. Amen. All right, guys, go conquer the world. And next week...